Welcome to Mindscapes, a series of conversations with men and women whose ideas, visions and philosophy define contemporary India. My guest today is a charismatic winner of the Gyan Peet Award. He's traversed a long journey from a lecturership in English literature to the pinnacle of writing in India. He's applauded for his work as a novelist and philosopher in Canada. I'm delighted to welcome Professor Anantamurti. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, you have said that uh, writing is a spiritually healing process for you. In what ways is writing spiritually healing for you? Um, it is a, a profound confession that one makes. You know, we are all social beings, and in our role as a social being, we cannot achieve full honesty. You are pretending a little, you are trying to be nice, and uh, you smile when you don't really want to smile. All of us have a, a role as a social being. But as when you are a writer, at least in the act of writing, one would be able to overcome the limitations of the social being and be totally truthful. And that is also made possible through uh, devices. Metaphor is a great device. I think you overcome all those limitations, you know, which uh, realistic speaking cannot communicate through metaphor. And hence it is spiritually healing, because you are encountering yourself. And it is not uh, talking to others. It is somewhere profoundly uh, a dialogue which you carry on with yourself, and uh, you are alone when you do it. It is done in solitude, but later on is shared by uh, with others. But is there is there a sort of a, a concern that in some way it's frozen in time that it's written? No. I think the process is like this. If you are a writer, and if you are lucky. Not always we are lucky. Even a lucky writer is not lucky always. You write about a certain problem which has deeply bothered you in your solitude. But by luck, by great fortune, it so happens that it's a problem shared by many people who are also alone. And hence a, a very profound communication takes place. I call it profound because when you are reading, you can close the book, you can stop reading, your mind can wander away, and you need not read. There is no compulsion for you to read. Still you read what I have written, and that is like a gift of attention for me. I mean the writing should have those qualities which can get that kind of attention from the reader who is also in solitude, who is also communicating with himself or herself, and hence, you know, this is made So possible. in some ways, it is a social act, and, and, and yet you say that writing is a social. I would say it's a profoundly a social act because it doesn't intend to please anyone or anger anyone. You know, it doesn't have any such intentions. It is. Uh, not communication, but a kind of communion. And communion is deeper than communication. And hence, uh, it's wrong to call it an asocial act. I mean, it's like uh, thinking in binary terms. But many social acts are not deeply social acts. This is a, a much more profound social act. Because you, you are attempting at communion rather than communication at the conscious level only. It, we have a conscious level, we have a deeper level which is unconscious. I think a great writing touches you in your unconscious as well, you know, which you did not think uh, you knew. It, it may, not all writing, you know, very specially. That's why I said one has to be lucky to be able to do that. So that is sort of almost a, almost a poetic approach that, that, that your writing has that seeks this communion. Yeah. Uh, 
what role do you see in contrast to the more sort of activist, ideologically motivated, socially committed mm -hmm. uh, writing that, that seeks to, to galvanize action, that seeks to draw people into mm -hmm. ideology? That has formed a part of our literature. I have gone through that myself. You know, the, I also began to write under that kind of a notion. And I respect that, you know, I don't, uh, but I have developed skepticism about that. Skepticism because many times when you want to really move a reader, you may affect uh, certain, uh, a certain pose to yourself, you know, of the world reformer and so on. When you do that, the reader sometimes, you know, when he, when if he or she is immature or uh, maybe under your spell, but when once a reader thinks that I was under somebody's spell and then he or she used those devices to keep me under spell, you come out of spell also and then you are no longer impressed. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And hence very ideological writing in the long run is not effective ideologically even. This aspect of, of, of communication and articulation uh, in, 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 in your novels, uh, th there, are, uh, there, are, there is a sort of uh, almost a value system between characters who struggle to articulate uh, mm. and, 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 and those that uh, are more articulate. And this sort of counters in a sense with, with our environment where we are confronted with an over-articulation uh, through the media, through the newspaper, mm -hmm. everything, every nuance of human experience is being in some ways mm -hmm. articulated. Um, mm -hmm. What is the special insight process technique uh, that, that, that a writer uses to communicate this, this debasing of articulation in a sense? There has always been this problem in writing. The, that which is easily articulable, you know, that which is easily articulated is not profound. Your articulation will have to reach the point of silence. I mean, the ideal is silence. And the articulation will have to be profound enough to look like silence. I think in great poetry that happens. It's not the word, you know, which uh, moves you, something beyond the word and you begin to listen to the silence and, and, and it's very difficult to talk about it. You know, you can only experience it, you know, in very great poetry. Your, your writing is, 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 is described as more poetry than writing. It's sort of poetic writing. Do you think that's a fair description? Uh, not that I always succeed, you know. I mean, if you have that kind of an ideal in writing, many times you fail, you know, because you cannot read that. Uh, you know what I have felt when I write? I start with what I know. And in the very process of writing, if I do not begin discovering, and if I say, look, what is the next sentence? Ah, this is. Mm -hmm. And I have not forethought it. Then I know that I am writing. It happens sometimes, but doesn't happen always. Many times, you know, the whole structure is ready and then you put it and then you have not really discovered anything more than what you started with. But there is a discovery. It has happened to me sometimes, but not always. This must be true of many writers. So when you say that you, you, you start off with writing what you know, what is it that, 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 that starts you off? That, that triggers uh, a novel, just sort of the fact that you want to write a novel, uh, an idea that you know, that you feel you want to explore and you want to write to explore it. What is the urge? What is the impulse? Uh, sometimes it is an obsession, a big kind of an obsession could be. And then something happens which may start you off. I will give an example. Some years ago, nearly 10 years ago, you know, I was very preoccupied with Karl Marx's 
one phrase, village idiot, idiocy of the village. So, as if you know, the human consciousness can grow only when it is under conflict in a city, in an evolved civilization. Otherwise, there is a kind of village idiocy, you know, where the consciousness has not grown. Marx is thinking of progress and history and so on. I was really bothered, is that true? And if that is true, then I have to think that the whole Indian civilization is at a lower level. Mm -hmm. And those who have gone through the conflict, industrial revolution, etc., are at a higher level. And if we go higher, they will still go higher. Mm -hmm. So there is no end. Mm -hmm. So it's a very colonial idea, I thought. But I, I didn't know how to write about it. My, my daughter once asked me when I was sitting in a hall, she showed it to a grasshopper. And she said, Appa, what, what, what is it? I told her, it is called in my language, Suryana Kudre, mm -hmm. Stallion of the Sun, mm -hmm. Sanhar. And then suddenly I told her, look, this little insect is called Hars for the Sun. Mm -hmm. And some, it must have occurred in a village where my la language is spoken. Mm -hmm. To look at a little insect, which is so bright, you know, so mm -hmm. connecting sun and the whole of nature and a little insect. So there is a, a kind of a uh, relating to is happening, you know, of great phenomena. And that started off a story in me, the image of the sun heart. And then I thought that somebody who can connect a little insect with the sun, with the whole universe, couldn't be an idiot. Mm -hmm. There is a spiritual thought behind it, an awareness of the oneness, holistic nature of the whole universe mm -hmm. in a little word. Mm -hmm. So that sanhar became a point around which a whole story was mm -hmm. born. I wait for some such metaphor to occur mm -hmm. to me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then <coughs> I begin to write. Mm. You have been a teacher of literature and hence obviously also a student of, of the structures and styles and technique and craft of writing. Uh, in, in this process of translating this, this, this insight and process of discovery, how consciously does the craft of writing uh, come into play? you know, sort of structuring mm -hmm. a novel so that it has a beginning, mm -hmm. a middle, and an end. Uh, <coughs> some of your, uh, your, your early work certainly uh, was against this, this process mm -hmm. of, of, of structuring and, 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 and moving in, 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 a, in a form that craft was dictating this. But yet that was a form in itself. So to what degree and, and how does sort of craft and, and, and the flow mm -hmm. of discovery interact? I am reminded of a, a letter of Keats where he says, that poem should come like leaves to a tree. You know, the, it was not there yesterday, but then you see a young leaf, you know, coming out. <laughs> but what it also means is a lot of work is done by the tree. <laughs> <laughs> you know, getting all the its food from the earth and taking it up and interacting with the sun. Mm -hmm. A lot of work is also being done, mm -hmm. but it looks like a spontaneous act. All great art has that. There is a grammar which you have to learn. There is a craft which you have to really possess. You should be a good craftsman. And that means a lot of work, a lot of conscious struggle. Uh, but it should, after that, it is not a conscious thing any longer. It's a part of you. So in a novel, you know, I may make three drafts four drafts. Why? Because I am not happy with the first draft, not with the second draft. But if you ask me to put down on a piece of paper what are the rules of composition, I can't give you. So when you move from one draft to the other, hmm. do you rewrite? Or do you go through a, a, a proof and correct Sometimes and change? Sometimes I r r write the whole thing again. It's a new thing. It is like tapping yourself, you see, you know. It is like getting your full attention. Many times, you know, even when we talk or when we do anything, the hardest thing is to give your whole attention to your thing. 
to me the most spiritual act is to pay attention total attention <laughs> and sometimes i feel if you were to pay total attention to a thing you would get that uh, kind of a spark that ramana got mm -hmm. it is total attention mm -hmm. huh? mm -hmm. and then you you see mm -hmm. and that total attention in a, in a novel uh, is what you attempt at in every draft mm -hmm. a little more attention mm -hmm. and then fully attending to mm -hmm. what is in front of you even then mm -hmm. mortal as we are mm -hmm. there are areas which have not got all your attention mm -hmm. You've mentioned uh, the sacred. You've mentioned sort of you know the spiritual dimension of writing. Uh, when you were growing up, you were surrounded by the sacred and the spiritual, and there is this you know the story of you going and, and urinating on a sacred <laughs> stone because yeah. you wanted to sort of exercise yourself uh, of this. Do you feel that in some ways, as you grow older, the the sacred and the spiritual are asserting themselves again? No. I had to do it because. Well, if something is given to you by others forced on you you it's hard for you to accept one has to discover it oneself a lot of the sacred was also ideologically related to uh dominance you know i was a brahmin i grew up in a in a grahar and a lot of the idea of sacred was not just sacred to yourself it was also an instrument of dominance i had to destroy that and there i was yeah, very deeply influenced by mahatma gandhi as you know you know mahatma gandhi also did destroy a lot of what was considered sacred in order to rediscover the sacred the sacred is not discovered is not destroyed uh, in order to make this world dull and stupid and uh, in order to rediscover it i think the buddha did it whenever you have to reestablish the sacred you will have to question the traditional notion of the sacred you know nowadays when i think is you know i think there are two great passions of the 20th century hunger for god hunger for equality and the hunger for equality had to contend with a lot of the idea of god the hierarchical structures the structures that and so on but the hunger for god is as deep a hunger as hunger for equality you find the two coming together say in gandhi in martin luther king the hunger for god and hunger for equality are are there together in some of the greatest men of our century the two have come together and they look opposite of each other mm -hmm. sometimes mm -hmm. but they are not mm -hmm. but the a little destruction of the old idea of sacred is always involved in the rediscovery of the sacred and one feels sometimes you have you have destroyed the old idea of sacred and you have not been able to create anything new that kind of pain also i feel i mean <laughs> what what we create is not really as big as what was created in the past mm -hmm. but what was misused later on mm -hmm. i don't blame those who created the sacred mm -hmm. but it was misused later on you have to destroy it mm -hmm. but they are not compensated for it you know not enough particularly nowadays you know you feel sort of sad you know we have destroyed many things you know which were traditionally mm -hmm. held sacred mm -hmm. all that we have done is to globalize and then take you into your modern world system mm -hmm. <laughs> compared to which you know some of the traditional notions seem good I am confused now mm -hmm. about that. But wouldn't you say that the, the fact of the, the long continuity of our civilization has has inhibited uh, our ability uh, to? Uh, I'm uncomfortable with the word uh, destroy the sacred, mm. uh, but but uh, sort of to move beyond uh, our, our our traditional understanding mm. uh, and insights of the sacred, which become ritualistic, which become mechanistic, mm. into into fresh. incisive experiential insights mm -hmm. uh, of the sacred there's a poem in kannada you know when you were telling me this i was reminded of that <laughs> the title of the poem you know, is by a great poet called gopal krishna deva battalar da gange ganga who can't dry up he doesn't say who doesn't dry up who can't dry up 
you know, Ganga flows. And then it says, if only she had dried up for a while, there would have been the need for another Bhagiratha mm -hmm. <laughs> to bring her down. Mm -hmm. Sometimes about India, many of us creative writers have felt it. If only this was wholly destroyed. And we tend to take that kind of uh, compensatory, mm -hmm. you know, relief from what we were in the past. That is a tension in all creative writing. We have put it, you know, I have no answer to that. Mm -hmm. And sometimes, you know, what you, what you, what you, what you reach out to is already there and unearned, mm -hmm. and then you can repeat it, mm -hmm. you know, mechanically, and seem very sacred and, 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 and so on. Mm -hmm. It is like arriving without traveling. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like arriving without traveling. We are, most of us arrive without traveling. That's one of the problems of the Indian mind. Mm -hmm. And I think Indian creativity has to mm -hmm. uh, question it and mm -hmm. contend with it. I'm glad you asked that. <laughs> and I think one of the questions that, that we are confronting as, as, as a community is the aspect of pluralism. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, we talk about the Indian sensibility, we talk about the Indian heritage, um, and, 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 and you have um, uh, communicated so, so powerfully and, and insightfully writing in, in Canada, uh, and, and, and your writing is deeply rooted in your environment and your culture, and yet has this very universal uh, Indian ambience, Indian ethos, and Indian sensibility to it. If we were to try and, 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 and define what this Indianness, Indian sensibility that holds uh, a pluralistic country together. What do you think the, the elements of this might be? Very difficult to say. <coughs> I um, use the word civilization uh, because culture has to be in plural, cultures. But civilization could be singular. India is a civilization with several cultures. And if, you can, if we can define that civilization which, can, which has held all these cultures, then you know what has held them all together. Rabindranath Tagore had some sense of that civilizational uh, thing in India. Uh, but with the impact of globalization and, and so on, I wonder whether we will continue to respect our pluralities as much as we had to do, because there was no alternative to a kind of sameness. Now, there is an alternative to a, a certain kind of safe sameness for the whole country. Is that a good thing? It's not a good thing. Why not? <laughs> I'll tell you. <laughs> I, I, I care for a certain richness. Um, I can't argue about it. But I'll tell you what happened in India. A thousand years ago, Sanskrit, I think, was a great language which held the whole country together because any great, you know, whether it was a Shankaracharya or a Ramanuja or a Madhvacharya, would converse in Sanskrit and go <coughs> from one end of India to another. Mm -hmm. But a thousand years ago, <coughs> in my language, there was a book called, nearly exactly a thousand years ago, called Kaviraj Marga, mm -hmm. where he gave a model for Kannada to replace Sanskrit. Mm -hmm. So a great decentralization took place a thousand years ago. It happened in Europe, Latin gave place to all the European languages. Mm -hmm. You would never have a Dante, Dante otherwise, mm -hmm. or Shakespeare otherwise. Mm -hmm. They were great create. You know, uh, Latin had produced what it could and could no longer produce. Mm -hmm. So you had regional geniuses. Mm -hmm. Shakespeare is a regional genius. Dante is a regional genius. So too in India, we had a Pampa in my language and in several languages. And during the medieval period, all the Indian languages got empowered. And you have a Tulsidas, you have a Kabir, you have a Basava, you have a number of these great saint poets. Thousand years ago, the whole st uh, process started. So, in, in my language, 
Pampaya, a thousand years ago, writes, rewrites Mahabharata, and not only those rivers which flow into Vedavyasa's Mahabharata, little streams of Karnataka flow into Mahabharata. Mm -hmm. So do you think that content... That is a value in itself mm -hmm. for me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And now this, you know, I'm sorry, no, no. the globalization is taking it away. We will be eating the same bread that the New York eats, you know. <laughs> and it's not a good thing for me. Same books, reading the same books, you know, liking the same things and, and so on. It is going to be a crisis. I think humanity will get fatigued by that. I use the word fatigue. There is a spiritual fatigue, psychological fatigue. And then you want a certain difference. You know, to love humanity, I have to be different from the rest of the humanity. So, I think. <laughs> <laughs> so, Senator, thank you very much. Thank you. Welcome to Mindscapes, a series of conversations with men and women whose ideas, visions and philosophy define contemporary India. My guest today is a charismatic winner of the Gyan Peet Award. He's traversed a long journey from a lectureship in England. And hence it is spiritually healing because you are encountering yourself and is not talking to others. It is somewhere profoundly uh, a dialogue which you carry on with yourself. And uh, you are alone when you do it. It is done in solitude, but later on is shared by uh, with others. But yeah. is there is there a sort of a concern that in some way it's frozen in time that it's written? No. I think the process is like this. If you are a writer, and if you are lucky, not always we are lucky. English literature to the pinnacle of writing in India. He is applauded for his work as a novelist and philosopher in Canada. I'm delighted to welcome Professor Anantamurthy. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, you have said that uh, writing is a spiritually healing process for you. In what ways is writing spiritually healing for you? Um, it is a, a profound confession that one makes. You know, we are all social beings, and in our role as a social being, we cannot achieve full honesty. You are pretending even a lucky writer is not lucky always. You write about a certain problem which has deeply bothered you in your solitude. But by luck, by great fortune, it so happens that it's a problem shared by many people who are also alone. And hence, a, a very profound communication takes place. I call it profound because when you are reading, you can close the book. You can stop reading. Your mind can wander away. And you need not read. There is no compulsion for you to read. Still, you read a little. You are trying to be nice and uh, you smile when you don't really want to smile. All of us have a, a role as a social being. But as when you are a writer, at least in the act of writing, one would be able to overcome the limitations of the social being and be totally truthful. And that is also made possible through uh, devices. Metaphor is a great device. I think you overcome all those limitations, you know, which um, realistic speaking cannot communicate through metaphor. Uh, 